So thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, it's our pleasure to be here and to present some results of our study um, uh, which we did for the uh, EC, the European Commission. And uh, Katrin and I uh, were working uh, on this study and uh, we will yeah, do some highlights, some spots in this context. So what is the agenda for the next 40 minutes? Um, first of all, we would like to show you some of the background of the study. We would like to discuss the relevance and give you an insight regarding the theoretical framework, the research methodology. And then Katrin will provide you with the overview of the selected higher educational institutions and some findings, the overall challenges of entrepreneurship education and because I think we here are some political representatives, we would give you some implications regarding tentative policies. And of course, every study has its limitations. And uh, in the end, we would like to show you some contributions. Um, as we learned from the organizers, um, there are some rectors, some colleagues from universities in Finland, and are there any practitioners, entrepreneurs here in the room? No, I don't know, <laughs> just, just a few. So we will think about the uh, practical implications as well. So the title of our study is Supporting the Entrepreneurial Potential of Higher Education. It was a very competitive bit. It's, um, a research on uh, behalf of the European Commission. Uh, I mentioned that. Um, and we were very proud that we won this bit um, in this very competitive environment. The aim of the study was to investigate the entrepreneurship education activities of higher educational institutions across Europe in order to develop a stronger evidence base of the entrepreneurial potential of higher education and derive lessons for policy development. A team of uh, the Empirica um, Foundation, it's a um, cooperation partner of our university um, and my team, we did this study and you see the time frame was very tight, December 2013 until May 2015. And the study and the report is about 70 pages long and the case study is about 500 pages. So, uh, as you can see, it's uh, really a high achievement of uh, the study team within this short time frame. And uh, so now we can present you some highlights. The relevance of the uh, topic, yeah. As you can see by our colleague Fayol, Alan Fayol, entrepreneurship education is about entrepreneurial attitudes and skills. When we can look in the back. Peter Trucker has a wonderful quote. He said once, entrepreneurship is, has nothing to do with the genes. You can learn it like every discipline. It's not magic. It's not mysterious. So this is the approach of the study. It's, it's something you can learn. And uh, that's, I think, um, our philosophy, um, some people think it has only to do with, uh, with startups. But from our point of view, it's only, only a part of entrepreneurship. Startup and growth, um, that's only a part. We have more a holistic view, so you have to think about entrepreneurship. You, think, you have to think entrepreneurial and it's, the purpose is to develop the right skills and attitudes within our universities. So it's more the narrow approach, new venture creation and entrepreneurship in a wider sense is a mindset issue, to develop mindset. So this is the philosophy and the relevance of uh, the topic. And what also is important that 
the government, and we will see it, this at the end of the presentation, that the government can have a great influence in shaping the environment and the infrastructure that entrepreneurship education is fruitful. Yes, the challenge remains that, uh, yeah, the question is entrepreneurship can be, you can teach entrepreneurship in a more research-oriented way, so we call that um, about teaching about entrepreneurship, and we say teaching for entrepreneurship. What is the difference? The difference is that about entrepreneurship is more, uh, yeah, a research-oriented way of teaching, and for entrepreneurship is more a doing thing, what Timmons said once, entrepreneurship is a doing thing, that, so that you can learn the practical implementation. That's very important to make this difference. At universities, of course, we have to do research, and we have to think further in a research-oriented way, but also we have to build the infrastructure within the universities to yeah, to help students to do their own businesses, to support, give support infrastructures for spin-outs, and so on. Drivers and barriers, that's always interesting what the European Commission is interested in. How can they be supportive? And I think also for the national governments it is important to know how they can be supportive. Why? Yeah, is it important to have a theoretical framework for the study? To do 20 cases, you have to give a template, you have to give a, a, a guideline how to do this. And for us, it was important to look at the entrepreneurship education designs, to have a deeper look within the curricular structure and the extracurricular structure and the target groups, the EE setting, and what is also important, the institutional aspects. So what role does the leadership play, the university leadership play? The university leaders have a very important role in shaping the entrepreneurial activities within the universities. So, so we developed a holistic framework. You can see that here. So the design regarding objectives, status, format, contents, methods, media, feedback. So what competences should students finally have? What is the curricula and extracurricular offers? And what topics should they learn or do they learn? So it is important, the target groups, who are the offers aimed at, and what types of experts are involved in teaching and also mentoring. And what is important is the context. The context Every country, every region has a different context. Therefore, we have only the, done the case studies in a special environment and we have always looked at the context. And therefore, it's very difficult to generalize, to give uh, general recommendations, especially for government strategies. The research methodology um, it is a qualitative study. We had 20 higher education institutes across Europe. There are several, still several studies um, done for the European Commission. But what is unique with regard to this study is that we covered not the whole Europe, but it was a broad geographical coverage of the study. So first of all, we did three pilot case studies and then 17 follow-up case studies. Yeah, the template was big, about 20 and more issues the researchers had to look at. And yeah, how to select the case study, that was a very interactive process between the study team and the European Commission. It's always difficult to select, um, but the criteria is novelty, specific themes, lacking publicity, specific institutional aspects, and the geographical coverage. 
We all know from the study of Burton Clark in the 90s that Scandinavia is always ahead, Great Britain is always ahead with regard to entrepreneurship, education and universities. He studied different universities, Twente, Stratlight, Karmas in Sweden, and you have this university here, Yosu. I don't know my pronunciation, maybe it's not so good. Uh, it's, it's now, I think, the University of Eastern Finland. It was also a case in the 90s. So you started very early. Um, and uh, therefore, Finland and the other Scandinavian countries are very well developed in this context. Data collection, fieldwork instruction and case study template as guidance for authors. So that is a structured, they did structured interviews primary interviews with, with entrepreneurship educators and actors at case universities and, of course, desk research. Um, and the validation of the case studies through university gatekeeper. And we had other experts invited, like Johanna Moisel. She was also an expert in our study team uh, from Finland, from your minister. And uh, we had other great uh, expert, uh, experts from all over Europe and uh, Israel. Uh, so it was um, a good mixture of uh, yeah, colleagues. And uh, the categorization and coding of items and uh, the statements in Excel and Mexico data was the software um, regarding the, the research. So, as you can see, the map, we have the Finland, the case was Tampere. I hope my pronunciation is right, Tampere. Uh, we have Lund, uh, we have the University of Lassen, uh, Southern Denmark, here. Um, and we have um, Riga, we have the University of Lüneburg, Kosminski University in Poland. We have, uh, yeah, that was a suggestion of the European Commission, uh, Huddersfield. Um, and uh, of course, Cambridge is a very nice case. Uh, Wiza and I do know our colleague, Shaivia Kanam. He's a great colleague now in Cranfield. Uh, we have this um, interesting collaboration between um, uh, Dublin University and uh, the Ryanair uh, Academy. Um, we have Rotterdam, um, we have um, here, it's um, uh, in the Netherlands, where we have Rotterdam. What do we else do we have? We have here um, Linz, in Linz in Austria, we have Bucharest in Romania, and um, we have Italy in Milan, France, we have the EM Lyon, and Ljubljana. The, yeah, and Liège in uh, Belgium. So it's, um, you see, a wonderful mixture um, of universities. And um, so between Eastern and uh, Western uh, European countries. So the University uh, of Bucharest has nice master programs, um, one with a focus of uh, entrepreneurship and energy, and um, on, also um, master programs in continuous education. The University of Cambridge is a great example regarding the methodology uh, of teaching, uh, teaching approaches. Coimbra, one of the oldest universities in, in Portugal, uh, I forgot to mention that, yes. And uh, Kaunas University, University of Huddersfield, the Technical University of Kosice, Kasminski University of Poland, Liège, Linz, Ljubljana, you see Every university has unique elements regarding entrepreneurship education. It can be curricular related, extracurricular related. It can be related to the institutional aspects that they are unique and innovative. And maybe regarding the region, the stakeholder involvement. So different unique approaches regarding the entrepreneurship education approach. Interesting example is also the University of Osijek. Slavisat Singer uh, is doing a great job there. Rotterdam, of course, and of course, Tampere as well. 
So let's see now the findings and Katrin and the team did a great job regarding the writing of this case. He's doing all these interviews and writing. You can imagine how work intensive that is. And Katrin will now present you the findings. Yeah. Thank you very much. Also a warm welcome from my side. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. So thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Okay, concerning the findings, this will be according to the framework that uh, Professor Christine Falkmann has just shown you. And we're going to structure the findings. First of all, we're going to present some overall findings on the whole of all the universities. Then we're going to talk about the curricula and the extracurricular activities, which relates to the inner part of this diagram. We can present all findings, so we made a selection, which we hope you'll all find interesting. And then we're going to focus on the institutional aspects. Then next we'll talk about the stakeholder outreach to the external stakeholders, which is more in the context square. And finally, we'll talk about the impact. So we saw that we had the 20 universities on a whole, They stem from 19 different countries. Most universities are public. There are only two private universities, such as Lyon. Most universities are also general universities. The only university of applied science was actually Tempere. Is, is there anyone here from Tempere University? Oh, perfect. I see some hands. May, may I actually just ask so that we know your background and we can tailor the findings accordingly, because we were told that around half of you are university representatives. Is, is that correct? Who is, may, may I ask you to raise your hands who is a university representative? Okay, yeah, should be around half, I would guess. And then who is from the government swear? All right. And then we had some entrepreneurs, which we asked beforehand, and anyone else with a Exotic background. <laughs> I presume you're all involved in entrepreneurship education, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Perfect, yeah. <clears throat> so this way we can yet yeah, tailor the findings accordingly. Okay, to start with the overall findings, we tried to look at the case studies as a whole, and as we could see, which was also one of the selection criteria, there's a very high heterogeneity of the universities. So the first aspect was the length, which relates to the years of experience in terms of entrepreneurship education. Most universities had several decades or at least a longer period of years in terms of experience in entrepreneurship education. There was only one case, which was Kaunas, which only had three years of experience in entrepreneurship education, so it was very new. And it's interesting to see how the approaches also differ depending on the length of experience which you have. And then the second point was the comprehensiveness. So this relates to the um, breadth of the experience, which means how many curricula offers are there, how many extra curricula offers are there. What we didn't mention yet is all findings and all case studies are published online, so you can reread any example in more depth. And on the last slide, we also have the link, so you can read the final report and all 20 case studies if you have the time and if you are interested to see in more depth. And there's also always an overview table with the different offers per university. But the number varies, and which we could also see on the slide with the um, focus, with the themes, the table of the 20 universities, There are different focuses. So some, in some case studies, we focus more on curricular aspects. In some case studies, we focus more on extracurricular aspects and in some on institutional. So it varies a bit. And what we did in the methodology, we did not cover every aspect for every university, only the interesting and innovative aspects. So that also explains why on the graphs, which you will soon see, There's not always data available for all 20 universities because that's related to the focus. Yeah, <clears throat> so there's a whole diversity in terms of the comprehensiveness and the breadth. And then we also have the interdisciplinarity. What was quite interesting is that in a large size of the universities which we analyzed, 
entrepreneurship education was yeah, organized or coordinated um, via the business and economic schools. So there was a very large focus on that. And um, it also differed based on the universities, whether the courses were all offered in all different faculties and all different departments. And um, the target groups vary a lot from business to non-business students. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. And then we also had the anchoring. So that relates to whether entrepreneurship education is more internal inside the university and also in terms of the drivers, whether it was initiated by university management and whether support is high from sides of the university, whether demand is high from the students. And then we also have a more external focus where entrepreneurship education was more driven by the environment and where cooperation with the environment is very high. We'll also talk about that more in terms of the stakeholder cooperation. And one more interesting fact is that we could see, you can't talk about a real correlation, but it's only 20 universities, but you can see that the longer the experience was in entrepreneurship education, in general, the higher the comprehensiveness, so the higher usually the breadth, the more offers there are, the higher the interdisciplinarity and the higher the anchoring, just as an indication. Okay, so to also illustrate it a little bit, we always picked some examples so that you can find out a little bit more and see what some of the universities are doing. So starting with the Dublin City University, as Professor Falkman already mentioned, um, there's a cooperation with uh, Ryanair, so obviously um, in this field, um, cooperation with large enterprises and entrepreneurship education is very high, and there's also a focus on entrepreneurship as well. Then we have the example of Kaunas, which I, I found quite interesting because there's a large involvement of experts, but not only local experts, but also foreign experts. And we, of course, included that because they were also Finnish experts <laughs> and also experts from the US. And they were very involved in establishing and developing entrepreneurship education. Is there actually anyone in the room who is not from Finland and who teaches at another university abroad? OK, so we have representatives from Tampere who can maybe elaborate a little bit more on those examples, but not from the other universities. OK. And then um, coming to the University of Ljubljana, uh, where we have what I also find very interesting, a strong focus on design thinking. Um, so there's a more creative approach to entrepreneurship education, which might be a bit distinct to other universities as well. Then we have the example of Osicek, and this might also relate to other Eastern European universities, such as Bucharest, which was one of my case studies. And um, their entrepreneurship education was established from scratch in a difficult environment, meaning that funds were quite limited. It was very remote. It was a post-socialist, post-war country. So that's also interesting to look at the context because that influences entrepreneurship education as well and the conditions and the support you get for entrepreneurship education. And then we had the example of Rotterdam, which is um, yeah, a self-sustaining entrepreneurship center. It's actually, I, I have my degree from, my master degree from the University of Rotterdam, so I'm quite familiar with this example as well. And there they provide um, paid entrepreneurship education and they focus in terms of the target group, not so much on students, but they also focus very much on um, CEOs, on managers, on entrepreneurs, and a strong focus also on continuous education. All right, then we have a bunch of bar charts as well. So we can see here the entrepreneurship education drivers. I touched upon it a little bit already um, in terms of the promoters. So who initiated entrepreneurship education? We can see a distinction between external drivers and internal drivers. Internal drivers are more common. So multiple, with all those bar charts, multiple answers were possible. And that explains the base what I mentioned that not for all universities data was collected for all different aspects. So that will be the same in all those bar charts, just as a note of explanation. 
And in terms of the yeah, drivers, internal drivers were more common. The most yeah, common driver were obviously university teachers, but also support from university management, from the dean, the vice dean, the president, played an important role. And sometimes it was also a push strategy from the students asking for entrepreneurship offers. And then externally, the government, this is why we're all so here today, played a very important role as well in terms of the funding that they provided, the incentives they provided, the regulations, um, and fostering entrepreneurship education. Then we have the business sector, which relates to the supporting services, also again, the finances, also the presence maybe of a lot of enterprises in the region, which is also very important. And that also influenced the demand for entrepreneurship education. And then we also have other external drivers from the region playing a role, such as accelerators, incubators, and so on. And then, talking about the barriers, we will touch up on this one a little bit more with the challenges, point seven afterwards. Um, but just as a preparation, um, there were strong reservations against entrepreneurship, which we noticed from different viewpoints. So from um, university management, from um, students, from instructors. And one concern was that entrepreneurship might be a commercial activity and there was some resistance against it as being commercial and also some resistance because it can be, as we saw with the difference in educating about and for entrepreneurship, it can be very practical and some theoretically or academically focused universities do not like that orientation so much. So this can also create tension. And then there are, of course, different cultures and different habits and also different ways of structuring courses, of evaluating courses in different disciplines, which can create tension again then students might be um, not interested in entrepreneurship courses because they do not want to be self-employed. They want to um, be employed by larger corporations. And it just doesn't create a high demand or a high commitment. That might be one issue. And then we also have sometimes coordination difficulties if entrepreneurship is only um, coordinated by one department uh, or if it's coordinated by a multitude of departments and they don't really know what the others are doing and it's not a lot of communication and coordination, which might also create a barrier in terms of entrepreneurship education. And then we also have the point that entrepreneurship education is very personal intensive, which means if funds are limited and resources in terms of human, human resources are limited, it makes it difficult. Um, to engage in entrepreneurship education. And in this respect, it might also be interesting to see that online learning and blended learning was not as wide, widespread as I personally would have expected. And this might also be an interesting way to save resources, resources, resources. And some universities, such as the University of Cambridge, for instance, or Rotterdam, are quite active in ter terms of entrepreneurship education with the focus on online learning and blended learning. Then moving to the curricular activities, we can see that different formats were offered. And yeah, the slide I think speaks for itself. So the most common way of entrepreneurship education in the curricula sphere is through courses, but then we also had degree programs where a whole degree focused on entrepreneurship. We had specializations, we had parts of the courses or tutorials that varied. Then in terms of the teachers, um, most teachers are internal from the university since we also analyzed universities that might make sense as well. So entre uh, university professors against engaged in entrepreneurship education, academic staff, but then we also had some external instructors, very common were entrepreneurs, and then we also had other business people, which means managers or consultants that varied. And then we also had some external trainers, which were involved in entrepreneurship education. Then um, to give some examples, 
um, in terms of curricular entrepreneurship education, for instance, the University of Bucharest um, initiated a um, new master in entrepreneurship education, which I think is quite interesting with the focus on the energy sector. So there were some offers which were very tailored and had a very particular focus. And for instance, in um, Kashitsa, business simulation was used as a unique technique or method in terms of entrepreneurship education. Linz focused a lot on patents. Mm. So um, there was cooperation with patent scouts in, in the entrepreneurship education. Then Lund, for instance, had two particular programs, um, master programs for entrepreneurship education. One was more focused on intrapreneurship and one was more focused on entrepreneurships. Entrepreneurship and the curricula was very different. And then Tempera, as the Finnish example, of course, there we had the um, Pro Academy program and that was focused on team entrepreneurship and team learning and um, in this case, um, students spend two and a half years working with team entrepreneurs, setting up a real company, and they also received support from mentors in that process. Then moving to the extracurricular activities and the entrepreneurship education um, forms offered in terms of extracurricular activities, it's a bit different compared to curricular activities. There we can see I would say the classical extracurricular activity are still the competitions and the awards. So 73% of all 20 universities, or wrong, in this case 11 universities, engaged in um, competitions and awards. Then we also had entrepreneurship clubs, fairs, lectures and workshops, which might be single events or a series, and other forms, for instance, involvement by student organizations. Then, as an example, I think Cambridge is quite a well-known example in terms of extracurricular education. I'm not go, going to go into depth, but they have a whole variety of extracurricular offers ranging from one-time or regular events to longer events. They also focus on different target groups, such as female entrepreneurs. Kashitsa is an example where they adopted um, the ASU which can be um, described as activity increases success. Yeah, um, initiative, which is also adopted by um, different universities. So some universities, they make use of initiatives which are adopted in several countries. Um, then in Rotterdam, we had a, an example which focused more on startup entrepreneurs and supporting them in their startup process and also they used flipped classroom approaches since you're all in the field of education that's also an interesting new new development which also is used in entrepreneurship education and then we have the example of Valen valencia where a train the trainers approach was employed which is only which is not that common about one third of the universities they train their trainers only and they're was a summer, a summer school which focused on educating professors. Um, and then um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker through the findings so that we still have enough time for the discussion. And then we also had the institutional aspects. What's interesting in this graph is that we can see that half of the universities make entrepreneurship education part of their strategy and the other half, they do it explicitly or implicitly, or they do not mention it at all in the university strategy. Well, this sample is, of course, biased because we focused on universities who focus on entrepreneurship education. So this, in this respect, the likelihood is higher. Um, and then we looked at the type of coordinating entrepreneurship education. It was most common to coordinate entrepreneurship education in a central manner, so at a magnet approach, then we had examples of mixed coordination, and then we had examples of decentral coordination, so in a radiant approach. To illustrate it, for instance, the University of Southern Denmark had a center which coordinated entrepreneurship education in a central approach. Um, or Rotterdam, they also had a, a center, and what I mentioned 
it's quite common to have it located in the business and management schools or economic schools. There we can see another example. And then Tempera, the Finnish example, um, there the Y campus was initiated in 2012 for mainstreaming entrepreneurship education and they coordinate and um, yeah, organize all entrepreneurship education activities and also all support in terms of mentoring, coaching. And we were told that this is going to play an even more important role, the Y campus in the future as well. And then in Huddersfield, it was mixed. So there were enterprise teams in charge of coordinating entrepreneurship education. But then there was a lot of freedom in the way that it's executed. And in Lyon, for instance, there were different entrepreneurship teachers from different departments, um, although the whole university is committed to teaching entrepreneurship. And then in terms of the stakeholder involvement, um, there were a lot of external stakeholders. It varies in terms of the stakeholders being involved. And it also um, varies in terms of the geographical coverage. So there was some cooperation which was local, some was national, some was international. For instance, Lund University and also Coimbra were examples with strong stakeholder um, collaboration. And the most common form was lecturing and presenting. And then, which is also quite interesting and I think also typical in the entrepreneurship sphere, is the mentoring, coaching and advising support. Then we also had finance, board membership or other types of support services again, largely from accelerators and incubators. And finally, the impact measurement. What's quite striking is that 20% of those 15 universities did not evaluate entrepreneurship education, the impact or the outcome. Um, what um, we can see is that if it's evaluated, there are different forms. Most common is to measure the amount of startups. And then also alumni surveys were quite common and external entrepreneurship surveys such as the GUESS, which was initiated or which was employed in Rotterdam or Linz is a common way of measuring outcomes. And then also some universities such as Cambridge, they created their own tools for measuring entrepreneurship education and the success. Oftentimes it was measured in the beginning of the course at, at the end and sometimes even later, two years after finishing the course. And then moving to my last slide is are the overall challenges of entrepreneurship education. So we identified six challenges. So the first one is overcoming reservations against entrepreneurship education. I already um, covered that. So reservations might be from students, university instructors or management. So how can they be overcome? You can include entrepreneurship more in the university strategy. You can establish more management positions related to entrepreneurship, or you can incentivize um, students to, and also instruct us to engage in entrepreneurship education. Then the second challenge is the sustainable finance, which will be covered in the next slides a little bit more. So the challenge is that there's a lack of finance. Finance is mostly not stable, so there are high fluctuations, which make it difficult to plan ahead. And then also assuring the quality of entrepreneurship. Teaching relates to the fact that oftentimes it's dependent on individuals. So when the individuals leave, courses are no longer continued and knowledge is not really captured. So that is a challenge. And we also have the challenge in terms of assuring the quality of extracurricular entrepreneurship education, oftentimes it's not that yeah, rewarded, so many instructors do not like to engage in it. There are no standardized procedures, which makes it difficult. And then we also have the low interest and demand and commitment from sides of the students as a challenge. Then we have the networks, oftentimes they're not formal, they're informal. Um, so there's little procedures in terms of coordinating the networks and then there's also a limited amount of databases and um, of, yeah, of ways of keeping track 
especially with regard to alumni. So alumni are not that much involved in entrepreneurship education yet. And the final challenge, which we just saw, is measuring the outcomes and impacts. It's difficult to quantify entrepreneurship education, and it's also difficult in terms of the longitudinal design and the time lags. Okay, that was it from my side. I don't know. Do we have still time uh, regarding the tentative polit policy implications? Okay, scientists are uh, always struggling with uh, uh, policy implications uh, because the question is to have 20 case studies. Uh, yes, what is valid? Is it uh, valid to uh, enough to to uh, political recommendations so to give advice? Um, but uh, we try <laughs> to give some some ideas. Um, the first. Uh, is uh, promoting establishment and development of entrepreneurship education, fostering knowledge exchange about entrepreneurship education, supporting entrepreneurship education in structural weak regions, supporting entrepreneurship teacher networks and entrepreneurship quality, creating positive le legal framework conditions for entrepreneurship education. This is very important. Ensuring the sustainability and uh, the, the, the platform support, and the question is the impact assessment. So we would like to focus on the first two, and then uh, the other three, five, six, and seven. So, yeah, how, how can uh, governments uh, contribute? Um, first of all, they can help to, um, to shape the infrastructure. Though structural change is one issue. Another issue is cultural change. But you can't do that in a short framework. You need time. And politicians are elected for four or five years. So to have a strategic plan, it's always difficult to implement that in the long run. But I think Finland did a good job in that and is still doing a good job in that. We have this as a, um, also as um, a role model uh, for other countries selected. Um, yeah, reaping more benefits of entrepreneurship education. Examples, we do have a lot of examples which help develop entrepreneurial mindset, skills and behavior. Katrin showed you the examples already. But what can policymakers do? They can uh, help to spread the knowledge. They can trigger public debates like here. So that's very important. And they can help to raise awareness. That's what I think is serious enough to say that politicians can have an influence, a positive influence, to generate a positive attitude to entrepreneurship. Not like in the 60s and 70s in Germany, I don't know how it was in, in Finland, but um, yeah, the entrepreneur as a capitalist exploiter. <laughs> so that was the picture, Karl Marx and uh, Adorno, Habermas, uh, whatever. Now it's more the time of Schumpeter, Schumpeterian ideas and our university and our faculty is the Schumpeter School of Business and Economics, different times. So raise awareness and uh, regarding a positive attitude to entrepreneurship is one important issue regarding government support. Fostering knowledge exchange about entrepreneurship education. Um, enhance existing entrepreneurship education offers or to help establish new ones. Okay, some universities do not have entrepreneurship. The question is, is it necessary to have entrepreneurship education? It's a question. For our university, it was a question of profile building because we have a high competition in Germany, especially in our area in North Rhine-Westphalia. So you have to build profile to make a difference. And for us, it was a focus. Uh, we focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and structural change. change so, but I do not say it's necessary for all universities because we are from the country of Humboldt uh, and the freedom of research and uh, teaching. So, but you can have a focus. 
and um, how to hand, but how to handle the fluctuation of teaching stuff. Okay, we are civil servants, we are from a public university, but how you can make sure, for example, yeah, we have PhD students, how, how you can keep the knowledge within the university they develop. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's always a, uh, a challenge, and uh, Katrin mentioned that, and we have to discuss that. Yeah, for the sake of practice-oriented education, students' involvement in commercial activities and involving real entrepreneurs as teachers, um, in some countries, it's not in the Scandinavian countries, so it's not maybe relevant uh, for you here. Um, yeah, you, you can't believe it, but uh, they lose, in, in some universities, uh, they lose benefits when they are engaging in commercial activities or, um, yeah, the university... Um, requires uh, that teachers uh, have to have a doctoral degree. Um, okay, it's, it's a question of national policy, and, um, but that's only a fact we have. Um, entrepreneurs, if you t take, for example, the, the United States, um, Bill Gates does not have a degree, uh, Steve Jobs had not a degree, so is it really important I do not want to say yes or no, it's just a question. Ensuring sustainability, I think that's a really challenge because, um, yeah, over a long period of time. Um, you need to have resources. If you have money, you have resources. So we have in Germany the example of the University of Lüneburg. I think they got 10 million from the EU Structural Fund. So if you have 10 million, think about that, then you have enough money to do something, to change, to, uh, to, uh, to set impulses. Uh, and, um, but if you do not have the money, it's, it's, it's difficult. So um, that's, that's something for the government to make sure that, that there are enough resources to uh, stimulate the entrepreneurial process within the, the universities. So support um, regarding the platforms, um, Katrin talked about the uh, curricular and extracurricular offers. Um, the government can give support within the regions. Uh, for example, um, yeah, Enactus, junior achievement, to, to, to give uh, promotion, to, to give awards um, regarding the best entrepreneurs of the region. Um, there are a lot of uh, impulses you can set as, as, a, uh, as a government. Um, yes, that so far to policy recommendations. Um, we can have a discussion afterwards regarding these issues. Yes, as I mentioned, every uh, study has limitations. Uh, cases have a dedicated focus and um, so they are not necessarily representative. Of course, no one-size-fits-all approach for entrepreneurship education. Uh, we have different countries. The north is completely different from the south, um, from the east. Um, so um, different cultures, different settings, um, policies. Um, so therefore, you have to be careful to, to give uh, advices or recommendations. Um, yeah, but the purpose of our study was just to give an insight. What is going on in Europe? And the 20 cases uh, you have seen are, it's, it's, a, it's a broad geographical coverage and um, therefore just to give insights, to learn from each other and that's what, what we think is, is, the, is the most valuable issue that, that we all yeah, that, that, that governments can create platforms where, where we meet and can exchange ideas, like, like IFA, the IFA network uh, is a very good example for that. So, for future research, replication of study with further higher education institutions, research on impact of university regulations, resource setting and support structure on characteristics, quality parameters, and so on. Yeah, exchange of best Practices, I mentioned that, and of course, um, every country has to reflect on their current legislation. That's important. 
is is that still does the legislation fit with the university uh, management approach um, so therefore it's always important to interact and to exchange uh, ideas and knowledge yes thank you for your attention Katrin I would like to thank you for listening and yeah now the floor is yours <laughs> we can have the discussion Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we got a very good insight uh, of the situation in Europe, really, uh, with, with possibilities and with challenges. And that's, that's, a, that's what we wanted, really. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, and it was interesting to notice that 47% that uh, oh, of the universities, uh, in the case studies, they, they didn't uh, have EE embedded in their strategies, mm -hmm. strategies. and, and at, at the same time, 20 of the universities, 20% of the universities didn't have any impact evaluation, as you, as you mentioned. So uh, it seems uh, interesting, and it, uh, it reminds me of, of the situation in Finland, uh, which we are going to uh, get more knowledge a bit later. But <laughs> anyway, so I think there there must be uh, questions. Uh, so. The floor is yours. Uh, please give your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa. So use the mics. Just yeah, just wait for the mic, just in case the other ones. Thank you, Christine, once again. Very interesting study. Uh, as I know that you know fairly well, or very well, the global situation as well, you follow these questions. How do you see the European situation compared with the global developments in entrepreneurship education? Yeah. As you know, the United States is um, doing yeah, a very good job. They have always the cases Stanford, of course. Uh, uh, it was interesting, uh, I, just to give you uh, the, the example, um, we are working together with, with a consultant and uh, he said, yeah, what do you think about Switzerland? Uh, uh, Zurich has now uh, to um, reinvent uh, themselves. And what they would like to do, they would like to become the Silicon Valley of Europe. So everybody is um, measuring um, its country or its region with Silicon Valley. But um, what uh, one uh, colleague said, don't try to copy Silicon Valley regarding the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, it's not always good to benchmark with the United States or with uh, Asia or, or other regions. Um, we can learn from each other and I think it's good to go to uh, Silicon Valley and to do all this, what, what we do and I think Finland Alto does it as well with this accelerator uh, ideas, uh, Finnish sauna concept you have. Um, to cooperate, to collaborate, to learn from each other, but um, but not to 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 copy the United States uh, uh, in in regarding uh, with regard to entrepreneurship education and in developing uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, of course, there, this is a great case, but uh, Silicon Valley is not the example, the only example. Uh, the Route 228, okay, is also a great example. Uh, you can read about all these uh, wonderful cases uh, in books and, and uh, in the internet. Um, what I think, what I missed here in Europe, and, and that, that maybe we can think about um, the, 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 the MOOCs, uh, Massive Open Online uh, Courses, um, I think only two or three cases use MOOCs. Um, and because we are now moving on we, we 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 become more and more a virtual society um, i I prefer <laughs> there are people around me, but we can 't change the time so to develop maybe MOOCs and and to go more in this uh, virtual context i think that's that 's uh, one future um, step we we can make and we can learn especially from stanford they, they are really great in, in uh, doing this. Um, so, yeah, these, these are only, uh, this, but we, in, in other contexts, I think 
we now better and better in comparison to the 90s, for example. It's even in Eastern Europe, uh, they're doing uh, good jobs there in, within the universities. They step by step. It's an evolutionary process, but um, I think we can compete. We'll be able to compete in the future. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it's, it's very good that you mentioned that there's no, no one-size-fits-all yeah. solution in these yeah. questions, and, and I'm very glad that you mentioned yeah. Humboldt also. <laughs> as the question, uh, as the discussion goes on in Finland too, that the universities are, uh, or uh, University of Applied Sciences are no, no, not enterprises as such. So, um, That's very important. We yeah. can't become enterprises and do not want to compete with enterprises because we are universities and even University of Applied Sciences um, have a, yeah, a research and teaching obligation still. <laughs> if I may add one point, that's also in the end we were having 13 interviews with experts and many of the experts in entrepreneurship education mentioned exactly that, that there is no one size fits all approach and that you should always consider the context of your university, the history, the culture and see what works in this particular case and that's what relating to what Professor Falkman just said, you can't copy and take what might work in other contexts, but you have to see what works for you and what is best for you to develop your own strategy in terms of entrepreneurship education. Right, so we, we've got active writers on the wall and have <laughs> from there. <laughs> Maybe it's <laughs> too conservative, notion. but uh, I think for us it's impor still important. Okay, some more questions, please. <clears throat> Ah, so people seem to be very satisfied with your presentation. It's, it's good to know this. Is that a sign that you are happy or, <laughs> or you are still time. something with all the time yeah. is running? Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a uh, sign on that people are thinking, <laughs> doing the thinking process really at yeah. the moment. It's just to stimulate the, the process. So. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you very much. I think we'll continue and finish.